journal Mathematical Biosciences. And he originally was an expert in dynamic programming, and he devoted much of his later work to the slowly emerging field of mathematical biology and medicine. In the preface to the first issue of the first volume of the new journal, Bellman argued that, quote, the complex systems encountered starting with a single cell presuppose for their understanding a set of new concepts, original mathematical methods, and the development of novel, novel techniques for the storage, retrieval, and processing of information. Progress calls for a full power of modern mathematics and modern computers combined with the striking capability now available for experimentation, end of quote. These words ring as true today as they were visionary in 1967, and they still provide the guidelines for articles published in mathematical biosciences. So shortly after Richard Bellman's death, the journal established the Bellman Prize in his honor. The prize is awarded every two years for an article that exemplifies Bellman's vision particularly well. An independent committee selects the article from among the submissions of a two-year period, ending two years before the award. This year's 15th Bellman Prize for the best paper of 2012 and 2013 recognized the article of risk perception and effectiveness of uncoordinated behavioral responses in an emerging epidemic by Piero Poletti, Marco Aielli, and Stefano Merle. These three are unfortunately not here, but they have been informed and they're very happy about this prize. The price case, not $1,600, but $1,250. We're a little cheaper, I'm afraid. <laughs> uh, Poletti, Agelli, and Merle addressed the fact that human behavioral changes can be triggered by uncoordinated responses that are driven by the risk perception of an emerging epidemic. Using a framework of evolutionary game theory that demonstrated that if the perceived risk associated with an epidemic is suffi sufficiently large, then even a small reduction in the number of potentially infectious contacts can remarkably affect the infection spread. Moreover, the epidemic spread is delayed if the individual's perception of risk is based on memory and the risk of infection is initially overestimated. The committee selecting the winning article for the 15th Berman Prize consisted of Professors Ruth Baker, University of Oxford. She is here somewhere, but I haven't met her yet. Victoria Booth, University of Michigan. Ilya Nemelman from Emory University. Sergei Pilyugin from the University of Florida. Hung Chu, Georgia Tech. Jonathan Rubin, University of Pittsburgh. Arthur Sherman, NIH, and Abdul Aziz Yakubu from Howard University. The committees, uh, committee members independently chose and ranked their top contenders among biomathematical sciences articles of 2012 and 2013, proposed them to the committee, and ultimately selected the award-winning article. So unfortunately, the uh, recipients are not here. But uh, we are impressed with them. There will be an announcement in the journal later this year. I believe that concludes our award session. And we go right into the next plenary talk, which will be given by Dr. Michael Savajo, who actually was the editor of chief, editor in chief of mathematical sciences for 10 years before I took it over. Mike Savajo got his training in Minneapolis, Minnesota, in engineering science and the University of Iowa, in physiology and system science, then moved to Stanford University for a PhD in cell physiology and system science, and the University of California, Los Angeles, as a postdoctoral fellow in biochemistry and biophysics. He did another postdoc at Stanford University in Stanford in microbiology. Presently, he is a distinguished professor in the Department of Biomedical Engineering and Microbiology graduate group at UC Davis. He has received numerous awards, and I will not read them all, but uh, I will just point out a few. He, has been, he was a Guggenheim Fellow and a Fulbright Fellow. He was elected into the Institute of Medicine of the National Academies. He was an Ulam Fellow. Uh, Ulam Scholar at Los Alamos, 
and he has received an honorary doctorate degree from the Universidad de Leida in Spain. Uh, in 2013, the University of Michigan established a collegiate professorship in his name uh, that is devoted to computational medicine and bioinformatics. Uh, he has been, of course, standing on the shoulders of giants like everybody else, but I think it's fair to say that he has been one of the true pioneers of systems biology, starting in the late 60s, uh, writing a seminal book in 1976, and he has is still working on these ideas of systems biology, the discovery of design principles, and uh, his newest uh, achievement is the concept of design spaces, of which he will talk today. So welcome, Mike Savajo. All set. Okay. There, there. That one's that one's yours. Okay. All set. Thanks. Okay. I think we're all there. Uh, thank you very much for that kind introduction, Eberhardt. Uh, pleased you're all here late this afternoon. You may be getting hungry already or tired. But this was the title that I put in the abstract. And uh, we've had some recent results, which I think are kind of exciting. So I'd like to add this to my title as well. Uh, <clears throat> so the context for what I'm going to say is this grand challenge in biology relating the genotype to the phenotype. And on the one hand, we have this very nice, discrete, digital description of the genotype. But over here, we have an analog description of phenotype. And I've listened to many talks throughout the week here and heard phenotype mentioned many, many times. And uh, it's a very descriptive kind of term. And the challenge is how we relate these two. And what is in between there is the complicated biochemistry which is necessary to realize these wonderful phenotypes. And of course, this is just a, a small section of what that represents. If we put all the unknowns in there, it's really a black box. And our task then is how are we gonna relate genotype to phenotype? So first of all, because it's a very complex entity that links these two, uh, we want to deconstruct those systems in some way. And there are a couple of reasons for that. One is the traditional sort of divide and conquer. That's better? OK. Is that better? Not really? Let me get a little closer. How's that? OK. Sorry. OK, so the traditional idea of divide and conquer to break up a complex system into simpler things we could understand and then try and reassemble things. <clears throat> 
or even when we've got a very complicated and complete model of something, we often want to reduce that model to improve efficiency for analysis, uh, prediction, or control. And some of the established methods of deconstructing complex systems based on breaking things up in space or time or by function, those are all well known. What I'd like to convince you of by the half of this talk or the end of it is that there's another method and that's what I'll call phenotypic deconstruction in system design space and it's very different from those other traditional approaches. So to get there, I'm gonna to have to define three concepts that may sound familiar, but a, what I mean by a system, what I mean by a phenotype and a design space. So what is the system? Uh, Art is limitation, the, ens the essence of every picture is the frame. And this is a statement made by a well-known uh, British author. But it makes a good point about how important it is when you talk about a system to define the boundaries of that system. And so I think of kind of a rule of thumb is to say we'd like to capture the internal interactions and maximize those in relation to the external interactions. So you could think of this as E. coli with thousands of interactions going on inside the cell and a half a dozen or so things that interact with the environment when it's growing in a minimal medium. So how do we represent then those biochemical systems that link genotype to phenotype in the environment? So there are many different descriptions of chemical change. If you ask a chemist, you might get a response that said, well, the only way is the quantum mechanical wave function, which is a discrete stochastic description. Another would say, no, I don't care about that. What I want to know is when I stretch this bond along some reaction coordinate, that's a potential energy function that I'm interested in. And that's a continuous kind of deterministic process. Yet another would say, I don't care about that either. I want to know when it snaps. That's a discrete stochastic event. And yet, if you have many of those snappings going on in large numbers over longer periods of time and in regulatory systems, you can get nice continuous functions and represent those by power laws. And yet a developmental biologist might say, I don't care about any of that. All I want to know is during development, did my gene get turned on or off? And I can use a Boolean function for that. So we tend to focus on this level because we can do a lot of analytical things. It's been very helpful for uh, revealing design principles of biochemical systems. And we realize that there are times when we either go up or down in this uh, spectrum, but for the most part, we get a lot of information by focusing on this level. And that's what I'll focus on for the most part. But in any case, whatever description you use, they're all approximations. If you hear someone say they've got the real version of things, look at their assumptions. So you've all heard this one before. You want to make things as simple as possible, but not simpler. Or that all theories are wrong, but some are useful. Or in theory, there's no difference between theory and practice. In practice, there is. And so the bottom line is that regardless of what models we come up with, the end determinant is going to be whether it agrees with the reality with the experiments and so forth. So this is the description we tend to use. We call this generalized mass action, a representation within the power law formalism. And this is simply sums of products of power laws. And this is nothing but traditional mass action kinetics when those exponents are small integer values. Ones, twos, very rarely a three, and nothing really beyond that. What's different about generalized mass action is that those exponents can be real numbers. They can have a fractional value. They can, in fact, be negative. It's a very plastic. Uh, canonical representation for lots of different nonlinear functions. That's a whole other topic I won't go into, but just to say that not only can this represent traditional chemical kinetics, but also biochemical kinetics with rational functions can be put exactly in this form. So to summarize then, I would say that I consider biological systems to be characterized by the integration of functional mechanisms governed by physical chemical principles and represented by these generalized mass action kinetics. So nothing in biology exists except in the light of systems, with pardons to Dobzhensky. Uh, here we got a genotype. We could say we've got this because we've got this complete sequence for a number of organisms, and it's a nice, clean, digital representation. But what's a phenotype? Here's a famous one, the wrinkled, smooth, yellow, green. Uh, animal phenotypes, 
all these different wonderful patterns in shells, different coat patterns in animals, uh, lean and obese mice, eye colors. Even in the microbial world, you can put down a single cell on a plate and forget about it for a week and you come back and you see these exotic patterns, which are a function of the organism that you put on that plate, its genotype if you like, and the composition of that plate, the environment. Even overnight, you can see the difference between rough and smooth colonies, which are used in clinical labs all over the world that are diagnostic of the virulence of that strain. Those are all phenotypes. What's the phenotype of a biochemical system, though? Well, here's one example. You could say there's a part of metabolism that's used in one direction in glycolysis and the other direction in gluconeogenesis. And you could color the reactions that go in one direction or the other, and, and those describe those two different phenotypes, if you like. Here's another example, a metabolomic study, where this is a, a given microbe exposed to two different drugs, and the dots in each case represent the different metabolites. And the colors represent whether they go up or down, and the bars between them are sort of correlations. You don't have to know the details, but you can just look at it, and you see that the top one is a very localized effect in the red, if you like, whereas the red in the bottom is very diffuse. Different phenotypes. Color them, describe them. How many phenotypes are there? Well, here's an interesting study with a freshwater worm. And they simply knocked out all the different genes in this, and there are 240 of these shown in the background. You see different color, different shape, sizes, and so forth. And that's just the knockouts. If you were to put each one of those genes between an inducible promoter and vary the level of expression of that gene, you get a whole slew of other phenotypes. So the point here is that we need a comparable quantitative concept that's lacking, and we need that if we're going to have any deep understanding between genotype and phenotype. We've already got a good description of the genotype, well-defined genetic sequence, but the phenotype is ad hoc, descriptive, vague, and without a generic definition, you can never hope to predict a phenotype that you've not already seen. So I'm going to give a definition of genotype, hope that it'll address those concerns of being rigorous, well-defined. So I want you to imagine a complicated biochemical system, and I'm just going to pick out three different metabolites, A, B, and C, and each of those is going to have processes which produce that metabolite and that utilize it or degrade it. Okay, so they're going to be input fluxes and, and effluxes. Now, if you were to take a snapshot at any given time of that, you could say that one of those input fluxes and one of those effluxes is going to be the maximum of the set for that particular metabolite. So in the case of A, uh, there's only one input here that would be the maximum. Uh, I'm sorry, one of the three here, would, there's only one exit here, one efflux, and that's the maximum. With C, well, there are a couple inputs and that's gonna be the largest, and a couple of exits and that's gonna be the largest, and so forth. But the definition is that it has to be a valid combination. Because if you just select the maximum fluxes in and out of every pool and try and put those together, it's not necessarily going to be self-consistent. Okay? So it's got to be a valid combination. So let's go back to the equations and show you what's going on here. This is a description. Each of those X uh, Ks represents an A, B, a C in that previous diagram. And I'm picking out one of the many influxes here and one of the effluxes here that's going to be the largest. And then you get this form of the equation. And that has some really nice properties, and we've studied that for years. The nice property is it's still nonlinear. There's products and, and exponents and so forth. But for the fixed points, you can convert that into a linear system and explore all the fixed, light, fixed point behavior in the linear domain. And so that has a nice, unique solution uh, in uh, logarithmic coordinates. And then the test comes that after you have the solution of this system here in steady state, you could put that solution back into the original equations and make sure that that particular one is the largest of all these and this is the largest of all those. And that's a set of linear inequalities in log coordinates. 
And when you solve that system, it's a regular linear programming problem, you get the boundaries between these phenotypic regions. And they're all linear hyperplanes. Real nice structure. So that leads to a couple other definitions of phenotype, if you like. We talk about the qualitatively distinct phenotypes as the characteristic phenotype that exists throughout a valid region, polytope, in parameter space. So you have these very irregular shapes, and all the parameters within those, all the fixed points within those, have a characteristic phenotype. And then the phenotypic repertoire is the complete set of these space-filling irregular polytopes in what we call a system design space. I have more to say about that in just a minute. So to summarize these important concepts then, a phenotype is the set or sets of concentrations and fluxes corresponding to a valid combination of dominant processes functioning within the intact system. A qualitatively distinct phenotype is the characteristic phenotype that exists throughout a region of uh, validity, a, a polytope in parameter space. And the phenotypic repertoire is the collection of these qualitatively distinct phenotypes integrated into a space-filling structure we call a system design space. So now we've got comparable definitions of genotype and phenotype. The genotype is the collection of genes for a system, whereas the phenotypic repertoire is the collection of qualitatively distinct phenotypes for a system. So I mentioned design space. What do we mean by that? It's a discrete structure linking phenotype, genotype, and environment, and probably best shown by means of an example. So I'll start out with a toy example, but it's a real one. And this is simply the different, two different forms of, of D-glucose that undergo uh, an exchange through an acyclic intermediate. And so uh, the only difference between those forms is the position of that side group. So there is the mathematical representation of the model, if you like. The model uh, boundary is the red square here. What's inside we can think of as genotypically determined parameters. There's one uh, dependent variable, so it's the simplest system I could think of. And everything outside is the environment, the concentration of the two different forms, which I'll call substrate and product here. And by putting different amounts of those into the environment, I can set up a thermodynamic drive in one direction or the other. So as an experimentalist, I can control the environment. The genotype is determining what's inside the box. And there are some equilibrium constants that go along with this. So here's the uh, system again. And this is a very simple system that's been studied for 100 years. And uh, it's a linear system. So there's the equation. And so if we pick different terms in the synthesis terms and different terms in, among the negative terms to be dominant, we get four possibilities. So taking the first of each, we get this particular fixed point. The first of the positive, the second of the negative is this, and so on. And here are the boundaries or the constraints within which that phenotype is valid. So there's a uh, a genotypic constraint here, which involves only the uh, genotypically determined parameters. And here's an environmental constraint, which involves this displacement from thermodynamic equilibrium. Okay, so here's the way we tend to look at this design space is we try and visualize it and put on the x-axis, typically an environmental variable we're interested in, and on the y-axis, a, a genotypically determined parameter. And then in the z direction, as a heat map, a phenotypic character. And in this case, it's the concentration of that acyclic intermediate. Now, so there's the actual solution. And if I asked you how many phenotypes are there, how many would say two? Anybody? Three? Three, some threes. Four? Four? Uh, typically, when I ask students, four, another four, OK. This is what they would draw. They would say, that's how I would separate these. It looks like they're three to me. Three phenotypes. There's a blue and a red and a green. Okay? Well, here's the solution just by taking the dominant terms. And you'd see it's a pretty good representation. It's not exact. It's a little more angular and this a little more rounded. But we're not really interested in precisely the accuracy here. What we're most interested in is the boundaries which distinguish these phenotypes 
And those are the boundaries, okay? And that's really interesting because it tells you something that the geneticists think about. Up here, we had what we thought were two different phenotypes, and in this region, it's really one. And if you look at that, what that says is that phenotype is only a function of the environment. It only varies by going across here. If you go up and down with a genotypic variation, nothing happens. It's only determined by the environment. Similarly, what we thought of as one phenotype here, the blue, we split it into two, and in this triangular region, it's only a function of the genotype. You vary the environment, nothing happens in that triangle. Down in here, it's a function of vari variations in both the environment and the genotype, the gene by environment interaction. And then there's a sort of neutral green area here. So those boundaries tell us something interesting about the real system. But if you're interested in the accuracy, this is plotting the difference between these two. And if you're away from the boundaries, it's pretty good. But of course, it's worst right on the boundaries because there is no dominance on the boundary. It's co-dominance, if you like. So here's another way we think of the phenotypic space or the design space. This is just coloring each of the different phenotypes with a different color. That's not, it's just enumerating them. So there are four of them here, and we color them one, two, three, four arbitrarily. Okay, so that's one place we start, is just enumerating the phenotypes and give them a color, if you like, and a number. Here's another kind of intuitive interpretation of what's going on with a phenotype that gives you a little insight into the chemistry. In this phenotype up here, that's governed when the first reaction is in rapid equilibrium. And the direction of the flux is determined by the second reaction. In this case, the product is pushing it to the left, and here it's pulling it to the right. And this is thermodynamic equilibrium in this vertical here. And down here, it's the second reaction that's in rapid equilibrium, and it's the substrate which is either pulling it to the left or pushing it to the right. And then these slices off here are where the reactions are being driven hard to the left or being driven hard to the right, and they're both essentially irreversible in that sense. Okay, so let me give you a little more interesting example, and that is the design of a synthetic oscillator. And this is one uh, I was involved in designing several years ago by taking pieces of nitrogen and metabolism and the lac operon and rewiring them to get a positive feedback loop and a negative feedback loop, much as the way you'd expect in a relaxation oscillator. Okay, we struggled to get all the parameters for this, either finding parameters in the literature, estimating some of the parameters, and trying to fit the data, and we can show that it's a damped oscillation. But it was a lot of work. But there's a nice prediction that you can make, and that is that if you cut the negative feedback loop so that there's only positive feedback, then you convert this into a bistable system, and that's what the experimental results showed. Okay, so this is the same system. Negative, a positive feedback loop here and a negative one here. And this is the, just enumerating the phenotypes. I don't know how many there are there. You could count them. But the ones that show a single number represent a phenotype which has a single fixed point. But you see that some of them have three. It means there are regions in which there are three fixed points and that tends to be diagnostic of a, a bistable region. And one of the ways we can see that is look at the bottom, which is the same design space, but now we're looking at a phenotypic character in the Z direction. In this case, it's the number of eigenvalues with positive real part. So all the blue are all stable states, all stable phenotypes around here. The red thing, which is uh, cradling this yellow region in here, has those are th regions with three uh, fixed points, and one of them has a positive real root. That's the unstable. And uh, the yellow has two uh, roots with positive real part, complex conjugates, so it's an unstable focus. And uh, you can look by sweeping across these, you can mimic a traditional bifurcation sort of analysis, and you see the, um, the bistable regions, uh, hot bifurcations, and so forth. And if you look at the oscillatory region in particular, uh, you see how the amplitude varies in the frequency. And uh, this has a global uh, bifurcation here, uh, a SNCC bifurcation, where there are actually uh, overlap between the oscillatory and the 
uh, bistable regions. I'm going to come back to that in a minute because here I want to transition to this new stuff. That oscillator thing took a lot of work to estimate all the parameters and get all those results and, and eventually get that picture of the design space. But I want to show you that we can now automate a lot of this analysis. And uh, we start off by distinguishing the relatively fixed parts of a system and the more variable parts. So we think of the architecture as being sort of the fixed parts that consist of the topology of the interactions. They're relatively easy to get. I won't say easy, but relatively compared to the harder parts. And they're high throughput methods that give you some of that connectivity. You can also get the signs of the interaction from various expression uh, arrays that uh, give you uh, whether they're positive or negative interactions in the system. And finally, the number of binding sites involved in the interactions is relatively small based on chemical principles. There's usually a maximum of about four. In any case, if you don't know what they are, that's a small sampling problem. So it isn't hard to get the architectural parts, okay? The variable parts, I consider the rate constants, which are much more difficult to measure. There are a few of them been measured in the test tube and you can't guarantee that those are the same as what you'd get in situ. And there are no high throughput methods for in situ kinetics. Similarly, the binding constants, you can get a few of those, but they're very difficult to determine and no high throughput methods for those either. So those are the more variable parts that are hard. So what we're doing is automating the, from the fixed part as much of this as we can. So give me another, I'll give you another toy example. This is a, a simple system with uh, two activators in a loop. And then there's an environmental variable which can uh, modulate this interaction here. And there are typical activator uh, steps here and here that involve rational function activations, if you like. So that's the architecture, uh, interactions, uh, number of binding sites in those rational functions and so forth. You get the number of cases here, the number of phenotypes, there's a total of 16, and you get those without specifying the parameters, just the architecture. Moreover, you can test for the validity of those and only half of those are valid, about half. There's 16, I think nine of them are valid. So there are nine phenotypes of this system. And moreover, the valid ones, you can calculate some phenotypic properties. The gain or the amplification factor, what we call log gain, and some of these is zero, some are two, here's a minus two, another zero and two and so forth. Those all come automatically. And another thing is the stability for those comes automatically. So we know that some are stable and some are unstable. Okay, so that's all automatic. You don't specify any of the parameters. You just put the architectural features of that model into the program and let it run. Now, of course, we are interested in parameters eventually, and we'd like to be able to estimate those. And the estimation problem in general, if you've got a high dimensional parameter space and you're trying to search that continuum, that's a very difficult problem. But this already has chunked up that space into a small, finite number of regions that you're interested in, the phenotypes, the qualitatively distinct phenotypes. And we can automatically find at least one set of parameter values that'll realize each one of those phenotypes. So here are some examples where you sort of start off on the boundary, and in fact, you can automatically push it toward the center of these regions. So you can get estimates for the parameter of that characteristic phenotype that's gonna be fairly accurate if you can get to the middle of the region uh, as we showed earlier. So that's also automatic. You don't have to know what the parameters are. You don't even have to guess to start. Uh, it's just a straightforward problem of linear programming. So another feature that you get out of this is what we call the automatic co-localization of phenotypes in a two-dimensional slice, some way where you can visualize, say, an important transition you're interested in between physiological behavior and pathological behavior, say. And this is just one example. And it turns out that you can ask how many of these phenotypic regions can you put in a two-dimensional slice? If you've got a very complex object, you'd like to visualize as much of the behavior as you can in a 2D slice, you can ask for the maximum number. In this case, it finds all the phenotypes. They're all represented in this particular view of the design space. In addition to co-localizing them, these phenotypes, you can actually put them in a sequence automatically to generate some desirable behaviors. 
So in the first example shown here, we'd like to go through the transitions of all the bistable states. And so you can order those phenotypes in this way. And what you see is that the unstable manifold is here in the middle, and it's always sandwiched between the two stable manifolds. And in one case, uh, the stability manifold here is very close to the unstable one, so with some noise, you maybe would often flip down. Over here, it's much closer to the lower thing, and with some noise, you might flip up. The second is the task in a synthetic biology uh, context is you'd like to maybe synthesize a certain kind of induction. And we've made up one here, but suppose you say you start off with some basal level of expression, and then after reaching some threshold, you have some amplification of that signal, and then you go through a, a hysteretic jump, and then back to some uh, activation, and eventually saturate. And you could say, can you realize that? And automatically, you can put parameters which will sequence the phenotypes. And if it's possible, it'll find them. And here it's found uh, phenotype 1, 5, the bistable phenotype in the middle here, another case with a, a slope of 2, and then finally a saturation at a high level. So these are really nice features that you can do automatically uh, with this structure. Now let me come back to the oscillator I talked about earlier. That's on the right here. And we found all the phenotypes for that by working hard to handcraft a particular example after estimating all the parameters. On the left is where we do that automatically. Parameter independent analysis, just give it the architecture and it finds something that's qualitatively close to this. In fact, it finds all of the same phenotypes. Uh, and it finds the middle of the oscillatory region here. And at this point, if you were interested in actually matching something much more carefully, it gives you a basis now to go in and refine your analysis with all the traditional techniques that you'd like. But you get all of this basically automatically without specifying any of the parameter values, just the architecture of the system. So how does this differ from our conventional modeling strategies? Uh, I've always started off with uh, finding as much available data or parameters that I can. Uh, for those that I don't find values, we have to estimate them by some kind of sampling, either to find a gradient and, and go to some minimization process. Once you get a fit to a set of data, then you might anal analyze that particular uh, representation and refine it. And Eventually, what you want to do is sample then the parameter space to make some novel predictions that you can go and generate data that, uh, a prediction of data that you'd go and do experiments for to test that. And if you can prove or, or support a prediction that wasn't built into it in the first place, then that kind of is a nice validation of the model. So that's what typically goes on. So this is different because instead of sampling the uh, parameter space at the end where you're looking for different phenotypes and making novel predictions, we already have that. So we start off with a global analysis of all the phenotypes to begin with. We just enumerate those without knowing the parameter values. Okay, we need parameter values. We get them by estimating in a continuous high dimensional space, maybe over here, whereas here, We've chunked up the space already into a finite number of regions that we can go in and, and predict parameter values, at least within each of those regions. So that's a much uh, easier process. Eventually, of course, we can refine and do additional analyses in either case at this point. But in the end, when we're sampling for phenotypes here and generating new data, here we've already got all the phenotypes, all the transitions. We can make predictions of data that could be tested. So in a sense, we think of we're almost putting the normal procedure on its head with this approach. So let me summarize then. Uh, we think I've given you a rigorous uh, quantitative definition of phenotype. It's a novel method for deconstructing biochemical systems. Uh, the phenotype is related to the genotype and the environment in the system design space. And I didn't have time to think of, to uh, deal with this much, but we can talk about evolution in design space, which links population genetics to uh, molecular biology and addresses questions of robustness and evolvability.
But in place of that, I added these new things, which is the automated design space analysis. It identifies the full repertoire of uh, phenotypic uh, behavior independent of parameter values. It determines parameter values for each of the phenotypes and determines parameters that allow you to localize, co-localize phenotypes in design space for efficient viewing and to uh, look at transitions between particular phenotypes you're interested in. And then finally, we could sequence these phenotypes in ways that could generate desired functions in, say, a synthetic biology context. And these are people who've been involved in this at one level or another, and I'd like to really emphasize Jason Lomnitz, who's been the driving force between this, the automated part of the material I've just mentioned. And I think I've got a few more minutes, so let me give you a little postscript that people uh, are often interested in the commonality between art and science, in my case, because my wife is an artist who pointed this out. But artists and neurobiologists have both been studying the perceptual commonality that underlies visual aesthetics. For example, years before the discovery of orientation sensitive cells, um, which are thought to be the building blocks of perception, Mondrian, in search of his constant truths concerning form, settled on the straight line as a major feature in his composition. And this is a neuroscientist who's making these, these parallels. So here's a quote, it says, every true artist has been inspired more by beauty of line and color and the relationship between them than by the concrete object of the picture. And that's uh, Mondrian. And he was very rigid about this, that the lines had to be vertical or horizontal, no exceptions. And of course, when you have someone who's kind of rigid like that, you can imagine what happens. Someone comes along and says, no, no, every true artist is more inspired by the beauty of diagonal lines and color than the relation between them. And this is uh, Van Duisburg. <laughs> and these two men were friends at one time. And this issue made them enemies. They fought for years over this. The story is they reconciled toward the end of their life, but uh, they took this very seriously. Uh, we're not that serious about it. Our lines can be diagonal, vertical, whatever. But the important point is every system we've looked at gives you a different uh, collection of phenotypes that it's like a fingerprint of the system. And uh, not only is it telling us something about the biology and some interesting math and behind this, but they're just beautiful pictures. And with that, I'll thank you for your attention. Well, it's not quite that, but it's a combinatorial thing that you can figure out, yeah. But it's kind of like that. Yeah, kind of like that. Right. That's correct. Well, you could think of that in two different ways. That would be one way. That would be going back to the elementary reactions. But you can also go directly from the rational functions, the Michaelis, Manton, Hill functions, uh, Jacob, Shenzhou, you know, whatever rational function that you want for your mechanisms. You can transform those rational functions exactly into that general mass, mass action. That's what I was trying to say earlier in saying that you can go from biochemical kinetics to that form. So that's exact. Yes, all those, any rate law you can think of that's, you know, rational function. <laughs>
But the other thing I would say when you talked about bifurcations, yes, when you cross these boundaries, you get many of the traditional bifurcations that we've you know, looked at in our experience so far. You get the hot bifurcations that are subcritical or supercritical. You get these uh, uh, sniff global, sniff, uh, global uh, bifurcations. But every other boundary in there, you're getting a, a bifurcation of a type that's not traditional. It could be something that just goes from uh, a, a signaling pathway, which is a linear response, and you cross a boundary, and all of a sudden it becomes a uh, square root function. Yes, oh, everything that we've seen and look, kind of look for, and we can't have been exhausted, but, but we find a lot of the traditional bifurcations all at once with this automated thing. Yeah, one of, well, I think what's related to your question is how is this going to scale as we get more complex systems? And this is one of the things we're looking at really intensively now. There are cases where we know why you get invalid combinations. And so we want to develop strategies where we prune the number of possibilities before, before we try everything. So that's one strategy. And the other is just to paralyze this all because every one of those choices, every phenotype, is completely independent of all the others. So it's what computer scientists call embarrassingly paralyzable, that you can send each one off to a processor, and so the bigger the, the cluster in the cloud, you can, you can do more with this. But eventually, that, that's going to be an issue, I think, because you're going to get you know, a very complicated system. And, and you're only going to be able to visualize, this is going to be a scientific visualization problem for anybody who's interested in this, how do you navigate that space? So you're still going to probably have to pick out certain phenotypes and certain genotypes that you might be interested in and look at that 2D slice maybe to, you can look at a few things in 3D, but beyond that, it, this, is, this is really a complex mathematical object in n dimensions, but it's a finite number of chunks. Thank you.